going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Civics 201 breakout session. What is affordable and how do we ensure it stays that way? My name is Tori Vogel. I'm a member of the Austin Young Chamber and it is my pleasure to introduce your session moderator and panelists today. Moderating our session today is Dr. Michael Hull. Dr. Hull is a physician, professor, and serial entrepreneurial entrepreneur at the University of Texas at Austin, where he is faculty at both Dell Medical School and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Welcome, Mike. Um, we are fortunate as well to have panelists that bring a diverse lens to the topic of affordability. Joining us from Texas Housers, Adam Pirtle is the organization's advocacy and uh, advocacy co-director. Providing a lens on affordability from a public utility company, we have Heidi Casper. Heidi is an energy efficiency services manager from Austin Energy. Welcome. And then lastly, we are joined by MD candidate Zach Timmons. Zach is co-founder and CEO of Good Apple, a grocery delivery service on a mission to end food insecurity. We are really excited for the expertise and viewpoints of our panelists. So without further ado, please take it away, Michael. All right, thank you so much, Tori, and welcome everyone. And really excited to be here and really grateful for the opportunity that the Austin Young Chamber has provided all of us to talk about this really important topic. A couple things I wanna say before we get started. One is please use the Q&A section of this platform. At the end of the discussion, my hope is that we have enough time to get to your questions. Um, and the second thing I wanna say is just thank you for giving your time and your passion to come and be fired up about these issues, to get knowledgeable about these issues so that you can take them back to your communities and make the world a little better. Um, affordability, like so many of the topics that have been discussed in the Civics 201 series, uh, is on the ballot. And this is a really important time to get engaged. And so just wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of us uh, in this particular session for caring about this and moving forward. So um, without further ado, I've got a little agenda for us. Uh, we're going to dive into the problem of affordability on the whole. And then we're going to talk about, I think, what all of us are excited about, potential solutions. So we're going to talk a bit about it from the lens of the private sector and then the public policy sector. Um, and then I'll say one other thing, which is that the majority of this talk is going to be around affordability as it relates to housing, because that is the biggest ticket item on most people's budgets. Um, but of course, there's a whole host of other things that people spend money on. And so we're going to end at least the formal part of our discussion talking about other types of expenses in people's budgets and what that means to their abilities to thrive. Um, and so uh, I'm going to dive right in with this first question, and I want to talk about the problem in particular. And so I'm wondering, and um, Heidi, I'm going to come at you first, if you can talk a little bit about kind of from the bird's eye view, what are the priorities? Maybe some of them are conflicting. Uh, and what are the challenges that we see as we're trying to make progress toward affordability, especially here in Austin? Sure. Um, so... I think right now you'll see that um, the cost of housing and transportation costs are really huge. So Project Connect is on the ballot and there's a lot of talk from various stakeholders about how this will affect our taxes. Um, so from a, from a very short term perspective, you could see it as a negative impact to affordability. But if you actually look at um, the impact transportation has on affordability, it's typically uh, the second largest expense right behind housing. So if we don't do something about transportation now, then it gets harder and harder to fix later. And as we see folks moving further and further out to try and find housing they can afford, their transportation bills expand. And so a lot of times people are making a trade-off for um, trying to afford a home that meets their needs and not realizing the impact to their bottom line, that whole cost of what that's gonna look like from a transportation expense as well. Um, some of the other things is a sort of an ever, um, an ever present battle between state priorities and control and local priorities and control. And 
you know, we can go back to 2014 when uh, Austin tried to pass a law that said you couldn't discriminate against people for using housing vouchers. So housing vouchers are one way that people can get into uh, private housing and make it more affordable. However, that that system is ripe with uh, landlords who don't want to take them uh, as as the source of income. And the state came back and said that Austin couldn't have that law. So um, the state has a number of laws in Texas that to remove some of the traditional affordability tools that uh, other parts of the country might be using. So we have to get more creative and we have to um, look at what those laws are and how do we work with them? Um, how do we advocate for change if necessary? Um, then in my sphere, <laughs> there, there, we hear a lot um, on the energy efficiency side. So we're trying to make homes that are more energy efficient, more water efficient, um, more environmentally friendly, better for our health. A lot of those things might come with some upfront cost, but they pay back eventually. So there's a balance between how much are we adding to the cost of the home to make it more efficient, make it last longer, make it healthier place to live, um, as opposed to how cheap it is to build out of the gate. So how that lens, I think, is kind of a common connector of like, how long do you have a view do you want to have on what, what uh, afford your affordability goals are? Is it tomorrow or is it, or is it a little longer than that? Yeah, thank you so much, Heidi. Um, Adam, I, I understand you might have some visuals for us for this particular question you want to share. And so I'm going to come your way and see if we can oh, get that. To OK, work. yeah, I, I do have some visuals. Um, Heidi, I really appreciated all your points. And thank you so much for having me. Texas Housers, we're a fair housing organization and we have been trying to help low income Texans get a quality home and a quality neighborhood for the last 30 years. I've been with the organization for about three. But I want to talk about two challenges that are standing in the way of creating an affordable and equitable community. The first is just systemic racism in housing. And the second is the failure of government and private developers at all levels to address extreme housing needs faced by the poorest among us. Uh, Kendra Garrett, I don't know if you got to see her housing one-on-one one -on -one presentation, but she touched on a lot of this, but I'm just gonna go into a little bit more detail on those two issues. And let me see here if I can share my screen. That's always a challenge. Uh, here we go. Are we seeing it? Okay. So it just, this just starts, I think we should start the story with the 1928 plan. I know that y'all talked about this in your keynote, but what the city of Austin did at that time is the um, black and Hispanic population was Sorry, Adam, separated you, throughout the- Again, I don't think it's- Pardon? Could you share your screen again? I don't think it's coming- Oh, across. sure. Oh, good. Technical difficulties, here we go. I apologize, y'all. We can see your desktop now. You're good. Can we see it now? Okay. So let's just start talking with the 20, 1928 plan. And this was when the city of Austin um, tried to concentrate all African Americans in the east side. Austin was originally a pretty integrated city. You can see here on this map that there were several freedmen's towns throughout the city. Here's um, Clarksville over here. Um, and then this is um, Wheatsville up here. So the, the black community was very much dispersed throughout the city. Um, you can see here, um, John Hindenburger, our co-director actually made these maps back in 1975, just the, the distribution of the black population in 1910, 1940, and 1970. And the 28 plan was really devastatingly effective at constant, it's segregating the black community. Um, what they did is, is that this, the city actually would not provide city services to black people who had decided to stay um, somewhere outside of the east side. So here in Clarksville, for instance, you can actually watch this documentary on YouTube. 
um, the city didn't um, pave roads or provide utilities um, until the 60s and 70s. Here's um, just a, a picture of uh, a, a young man drive, uh, riding down a, a, a dirt road in Clarksville. Kind of the same story with the Hispanic community in Austin, um, a little bit more dispersed. You can see here in 76 that there were actually a, a large Hispanic population here in South Austin um, near uh, Shoal Creek. That's since been seen a lot of gentrification. Um, this is a map from the um, city of Austin's analysis of impediments to fair housing. This is a fair housing plan that the city does every five years. This map shows um, the African-American population in 2000 and then again in 2016. Um, one of the things that y'all have probably been discussing a lot is the effects of gentrification. Um, Heidi talked about this a little bit too. You can see how the African-American population has really just been forced out of East Austin um, and moved up into Pflugerville and surrounding cities. Um, the city has just forced the African-American community uh, to move, you know, really twice, once from uh, Freedman's Towns into the east side, and now um, the east side is no longer um, safe. Uh, this is the Hispanic um, population in 2000 and 2016. Again, we can see that I-35 Mopac really is, serves as kind of a dividing line in the city between majority white census tracts and majority um, since people of color census tracts. Um, this map just shows the increase in the non-Hispanic white population um, between 2010 and 2016, and we can see a lot of movement into the east side. Um, Heidi talked a little bit about housing choice vouchers. Uh, you know, a lot of the affordable housing is concentrated in high poverty um, census tracts and in census tracts of the majority uh, black and brown. Um, these dots here represent housing choice vouchers from the um, Austin Housing Authority. You can see that they're concentrated in areas which are majority um, black and brown. Uh, green is 25, is a census tract that is 25% or less white, non Hispanic. And then the numbers go up. Red, a red census tract is majority 75% white or non Hispanic. You can see how vouchers are concentrated. Landlords who are in these areas aren't taking housing choice vouchers. And that has a lot to do with state policy that Heidi mentioned earlier that preempts cities from adopting um, policies that would prevent source of income discrimination. Um, housing choice vouchers are so also aren't able to find properties low poverty census tracts. This is really important. One of the most important things to break the cycle of poverty um, has been counted in numerous studies is to make sure that families are able to get into high opportunity areas with good schools, good jobs, um, and housing choice vouchers just don't have the ability to do that. Um, this just shows where um, publicly subsidized housing is located these green, uh, I guess that's a Pentagon, are that um, get a hub subsidy to reserve a, a units for low-income folks. As you can see, just like Section 8 vouchers, very few um, publicly subsidized uh, developments are getting built on the other side of MOPAC. So we're seeing a lot just here in Williamson County, this is the county line of LIHTC getting built up here on 183 in a low, fairly low poverty area but most of the public housing is concentrated in high poverty areas east of Mopac, mostly east of I-35. Um, this is a, the same story with race. Um, you know, these majority white communities, because of nimbyism, because of other reasons, uh, you know, zone requirement, requirements would make it hard to build multifamily units it's just hard to get um, affordable housing built in these areas. 
And this is really important. I mean, we talked about opportunity just a second ago, but one of the, I mean, this just a map shows school ratings for public schools. These, these ratings are from 2018. Dark green is A, light green is B, yellow is um, a C rating, orange is a D rating, uh, red is an F rating. You can see that the schools that are the highest ranked that often receive the most funding are in these um, low poverty majority of uh, you know, white census tracts where we're not getting affordable housing built. And so that's, you know, good schools, that's just kind of the one of the classic indicators for finding out if a neighborhood is high opportunity or not. Um, we need to be finding ways to get more truly affordable housing built in these areas. Um, I'm gonna skip this for now, we'll talk about it later. I think it's really important to emphasize that the main demand for housing is at the lowest income levels for the poorest Texans. Um, for folks that are making less than 30% uh, of the area median income in Austin, so those that's for a family of four, that's about um, $29,000, 94.7% of them are cost burdened meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income on rent. Um, you know, folks that are making between 31 AMI and 50% area median income, that's for a family for less than $48,000. 82% of those folks are cost burdened or paying more than 30% of income. Meanwhile, up here at the um, 81 to 100% AMI level, um, only 20% of those people are cost burdened. Um, and for folks who are paying 50% or more of their income on rent, meaning that they're extremely cost burdened or severely cost burdened, folks that are making less than 30% uh, of the area median income, 86 almost 87% of those folks are um, paying more than 50%. Meanwhile, at the upper income levels, only 0.3% of folks um, are paying more than 50% of their income on rent. So what this says is that we really need to be concentrating our efforts to be building affordable housing that is affordable to the poorest folks. Um, and this statistic, again, from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, um, oh, went too far, shows that um, for every 100 rental households, um, there are only 12 um, affordable units that are available for folks making at or below 30% AMI, again, for a family of four, that's about $29,000. Meanwhile, there's actually a surplus of units um, at the 80% MFI level. This is where a lot of um, affordable housing is, is tagged to the 80% area median income level, but we really, really, really need to be building affordable housing um, to serve folks, at, you know, at or below 50% AMI or at or below 30% AMI. Again, there's just this deficit of 88 units for um, extremely cost burdened people at the 30% AMI level and at the 50% AMI level. There's actually a surplus um, at or below 100%. So that's basically it. Um, just real quick before we move on, I'll stop my share. Uh, I think it's just, you know, we talk a lot about workforce housing um, when um, developers speak about, uh, you know, a building affordable housing. We just want to make sure that we're accommodating people in the whole workforce. You know, we're, we're essential workers at HEB working at a fast food restaurant making minimum wage. Those people are probably at the 30% AMI or 50% AMI level. So make sure when we're talking about workforce housing that we're taking care of those people because that's where the need is um, as those statistics show. So I appreciate the, the chance to get on my soapbox for a little bit and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. Um, it never fails to disturb me when I see maps like those. Um, and I think the other, just to drive home what you were talking about there, 
Uh, my clinical practice, for example, is a mobile unit. So we travel to find and care for the hardest to reach families in Central Texas. And many of them are, as you pointed on those maps, in that Eastern Austin Crescent. Um, and I think it's important to note that it's not just that folks are now far away from their favorite coffee shop. This means that people are far away from their healthcare providers, from social service agencies, from uh, grocery stores that sell healthy foods. And so um, thinking about it through the lens of what are all those various things that people need to make ends meet and to thrive and whether or not they're available in some of these areas, I think is a important one as we move toward the solutions part of our discussion. And so that's where I'm headed next. Uh, Zach, I'm coming to you. Um, I want to think a little bit about, I mentioned both the private sector and the public sector. We'll start with the private sector as a co-founder of a new company. Um, and as you think about uh, your future career in medicine, I'd love for you to paint us a picture of where you think solutions in particular in the, pub in the private sector and in private development companies uh, might allow us to have more progress in the affordability of our local communities. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And Adam, thank you so much for, for sharing that information. I think that really uh, hits home the point of housing being a, a huge ticket item. And when we talk about families um, who are having to you know, spend over 50% of their income on housing, that really leaves little money for other expenses. We, we spoke earlier about transportation, um, healthcare, food, all being really important. And so I think um, you know, that's just a, a great picture for us to kind of have a context with the rest of this conversation. Um, but I think, you know, I'll, uh, I'll state my bias as a, as a small business owner here in Austin, uh, but I think there's a huge opportunity um, and honestly a necessity of uh, there to be private and public um, partnerships. And I think uh, some of the solutions that we've seen, um, I can't speak as much to the housing uh, area, but I think one of the exciting ones that we've seen recently uh, in the food space, uh, has been really great. And I think, um, you know, we've always seen the, the private sector as having this opportunity of spurring innovation. And I think having worked in the food scene for the last uh, three years or so, uh, it's been incredible to see the different innovations, you know, the ability, uh, you know, we were talking just before the panel to have your groceries, you know, pre-ordered as you go to curbside at HEB or to have food from across the city delivered directly to your home. And those innovations are incredible. And the next step is how do we get those innovations available for everyone? Um, and I think um, there's huge opportunities and, and I'm not just talking about corporate social responsibility, but business sense. Um, I think one place that I've been really excited to see innovation for uh, families with low income uh, is around SNAP benefits. Um, and we've seen huge innovation here uh, just during COVID-19. Prior to the pandemic, um, you know, one uh, key area uh, that I think we were lacking in is the opportunity for SNAP benefits to be applied to uh, to uh, home delivered food. And, and those, I think those maps that you pointed out, Adam, um, you know, if we were to take those, uh, that same map and map it against where all of the food uh, access points are available in the city, I think we'd also see that a large majority of them tend to be west of I-35. And so the opportunity to have food delivered to your home is really a game changer for families who might not live close to a grocery store or may not have access to transportation. And so what we've seen during the pandemic, which is really exciting, is SNAP benefits opening to online delivery. And we've seen uh, companies like Amazon and HEB now be able to utilize uh, those uh, benefits in uh, certain states. Um, and so we're seeing families for the very first time having food, you know, delivered directly to their homes or the opportunity to pick it up and, and save, uh, you know, not only on transportation, but time. Um, so I think that's just one example of how public private partnerships can uh, really spur impact. And again, we're talking about something that really makes business sense um, for uh, the SNAP market in particular. If we look at the annual opportunity for businesses, we're talking about $60 billion a year. And so this is something where, you know, companies can get involved serving, you know, vulnerable communities, but also have it make business sense, which is really exciting. Uh, thank you, Zach. Um, how about you, Heidi? What's your take on what role the private sector has to play in helping with affordability around here? So I, I see it all the time. I, so I, I'm a government employee, um, but I think like you said, Zach, uh, those partnerships uh, are where it really um, 
really kind of you see some really neat solutions. So um, an example would be like the Mueller neighborhood. Um, there's the market rate housing there is fairly expensive, but um, because the city owned the airport and we had that land, there was an opportunity for us as a city to prioritize that being a complete community um, and it, it being a community of mixed income. And so there's actually a lot of affordable housing, a project we got to work with through the Austin Energy Green Building, which is where I've been for the last 10 years, uh, is the Jordan developed by Foundation Communities. And it's at Miller. Um, it's within walking distance of the ATB. It's going to be right next to the the schools and the shops and the services and within the um, close uh, downtown commute at Miller. And so I think that's um, there's probably not enough of that, but but those examples are are ones I think that we can build on. Um, the city has several others kind of in the works. We have other city land that we're looking to do similar things with. Um, and then the other place that we do a lot of um, partnering is through incentives. So um, we work with all of the smart housing in town. So the smart housing program is a, a city program that uh, offers fee waivers and um, when it's working correctly, uh, expedited permit review for housing developers in exchange for affordable housing being part of that development. And um, smart housing also uh, requires that they do our program, Green Building, so that we make sure that the housing is again of quality. It's not gonna fall apart. It's not full of toxic materials. It's gonna be efficient to own and operate as well. So. Um, incentives and partnering where we have land, uh, I think uh, those those are all great uh, ways that private sector and public sector can work together on it. That's great. Thanks, Heidi. I, let's dive in a little bit more to the public sector role. I'm curious, Adam, from your experience as you think about um, whether it's local, state, national policies, how is it that we can work to advocate for legislation? How is it that we can influence our policymakers to pass bills that will uh, increase affordability? Well, this uh, chamber has a lot of power to work on those things. So I'm really glad you asked that question. The session's coming up before we know it um, here at the state level. It'll start in January. And so we're preparing for that. Um, you know, I think one of the number one things you can do is just provide more money um, for affordable housing. Um, Austin has gone a long way towards doing that with the housing trust fund and other things, but we, the state needs to step in and be putting in more money from the general fund into building affordable housing. Um, another, another policy that I think we need to go for, uh, go forward with is just prohibiting source of income discrimination. We saw that voucher map earlier. Um, you know, the city of Austin, like Heidi said, city of Dallas, tried to make source of income discrimination illegal um, and the state came right back and um, uh, you know slapped Austin down and wouldn't let Austin protect its citizens that way. So um, next session we really should just prohibit that state that practice statewide, not just um, repeal the preemption. Um, and we need a lot of support from the private community to do that just because there are other private interests um, like the Texas Department Association or other groups that were responsible for getting that law put in place to begin with. Um, so I, I think it's time for younger folks who understand these issues to stand up and really try and um, push equitable policies forward. Um, another thing that Kendra mentioned, which I thought was really great in her presentation was ending the ban on inclusionary zoning, which um, would allow governments to require that new development include an affordability component right now we in Texas kind of have our hands tied behind our back because the state has taken that ability away from local jurisdictions to do that. So we're relying on density bonuses, which are great, but it's not enough power. Um, you know, we, we need a little bit more punch to be able to really start solving these issues. Um, ending basic, not in my backyard policies, um, like Texas requires that law, like all LIHTC, um, low income housing tax credit developments they have to get a large sign put in front that says affordable housing being built here. And um, 
that can create a lot of issues. Um, if these signs are out, they're actually bigger than the signs that are required to be put in front of like a toxic release inventory site, a site that's actually releasing dangerous chemicals into the air. I think it's a weird priority that we think that affordable housing is worse than a toxic site. Um, so that's wrong. Um, you know, right now the, um, the state, state representatives, um, uh, you know, when when you go through the LIHTC approval process, you get more points on your application if a state representative approves that application. So you can see that that would lead to a lot of NIMBY issues where a state rep wouldn't give a letter of approval or strike it down because uh, her his or her constituents don't want that um, project being built in their communities. Um, longer affordability periods for publicly subsidized properties, 40, 50, 60 years are great. Um, fund assistance for title clearing. Um, this is a big deal for preserving own, home ownership in lower income communities. Um, help folks keep land in their, the family. So help people transfer title to the new generation. A lot of times uh, mom or dad will die and they'll leave the home to four, you know, three, four kids and getting all that put back together can, is a huge legal hurdle. And a lot of low income folks just don't have access to lawyers to help with that, you know, giving more money to legal aid programs, working with private bar associations to solve that issue, help people with probates, really important. Mm -hmm. um, Kendra recommended that Texas find another revenue source aside from the property tax and sales tax. I think that's a great idea, but that's a pie that, you know, I, I hope that happens one day in my lifetime. Um, you know, cities also need to analyze the zoning code um, to, rend, to end racist zoning practices. I mean, one of these things is just, uh, you know, I work in Lubbock a lot. Cities concentrate industrial uses and environmental hazards in black and brown communities. Um, and so that creates a lot of health issues, lowers property value, et cetera. Austin, you, you know, if you look at the zoning map today, you can see that happen there. A lot of actually industrial uses have moved out of East Austin as gentrification has occurred. Um, so a, a, another practice which we need to look at is practices like large lot zoning, where lot, lot sizes in a neighborhood might be one acre minimum. Um, and that's just, you know, to keep poor people out, um, things like that. I mean, we need to be building, I would get rid of single family zoning if I could, um, and that might be controversial, but making sure that um, we're able to actually have flexibility in providing affordable housing and meeting housing needs. Um, talked for a long time. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's a, a really thoughtful <laughs> list. I wish I was taking notes, Adam, and I hope the Biden and Trump campaigns are listening in <laughs> as we think about your playbook here. But um, thank you for sharing that. I thank, thank you. We're, for uh, we are scooting right along here and uh, we're going to enter the last part. I want to tell a little story to bring some of this back to uh, the ground level from some of the policy talk. And while I'm doing that, maybe panelists, if you can move over to the Q&A section, you can see some of what's given, coming your way. Uh, we've got a lot of folks that are chiming in. So thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this through the lens of healthcare, if I may, for a moment, because I think that um, as we think about housing and then all the other costs that are imposed upon our local families, that has real tangible impact on people's ability to achieve their dreams and thrive in the richest country on earth. And, and I think about a little girl that I met several years ago um, that I'd like to, to share her story with you all. Um, I'll call her Chloe, and she came into my office when I was a medical student with a preceptor by her kindergarten teacher who had noticed bruises on her little legs and arms earlier that day at recess. And instead of letting the little girl go home, she was fearing that she was being abused, and so she brought her right to our clinic. Um, and I can remember her coming in because she had this little Cinderella blanket and she used to throw it over her head as I was trying to listen to her heart. Um, and we pretty quickly noticed that in addition to the bruises, uh, she also had some swollen um, lymph nodes on her neck, some gum bleeding, some recent weight loss. Uh, she had cancer and she had acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is the most common type of childhood blood cancer or ALL. 
Uh, and just as a side note, ALL until the 1960s was a death sentence. And then we found this drug called vincristine. And since then, the cure rates for this particular type of cancer are upwards of 90%, um, unless you're poor. And the backstory to Chloe was that while she was diagnosed with her cancer, uh, her dad was incarcerated on some drug charges and her mom was working not one, but two jobs to try to make ends meet. Uh, and she was really struggling to do so. So she was behind on her rent because it wasn't affordable and her landlord was on her case. Uh, she was struggling to keep up with her electricity bill. So her electricity get, kept getting shut off. Uh, she had an old broken down car, but she didn't have the cash on hand to fix it. So she was relying on public transportation, which was another cost of hers. Um, and that public transportation wasn't as reliable as she had hoped. And so she was often late to her job. So her bosses were on her case. Uh, and so she made what is to this day, one of the most heart wrenching decisions that I've ever seen a parent have to make. Uh, and that she sent her little girl uh, on chemotherapy to live with relatives while she took on a third job to try to make some of these ends meet. Um, and it so turns out that unfortunately on that same little Cinderella blanket, she slept on the floor with two other families in this crowded public housing uh, and her little body that didn't have much of an immune system caught a preventable infection and she never made it to first grade. Um, and so I tell you that story um, not to damper the mood of all of the dreaming big that we're doing in this conversation, but I think one to honor the legacy of that little girl um, and make sure that we push for public sector, private sector leaders to allow folks to be able to afford some of these basic needs. And also secondly, to bring home the fact that um, when families can't afford housing or food or transportation or health insurance, that matters to people's health. That matters to little boys and little girls across the country's ability to thrive in school and someday reach their potential. And so, um, Zach, I'm going to come to you before we get into the questions as you think about all the other host of uh, costs that families can incur. What are some potential solutions that you are seeing out there, ways to rock the boat? And I think in particular, um, I noticed one of the questions in the Q&A, um, how do we uh, get more young people involved um, and excited about pushing forward so that the little Chloe's out there in the world can reach their full potential. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for sharing that story, Mike. It's super powerful. And I think just really hits home that, you know, these are you know issues that we'll have debates about, but at the end of the day, they affect real people and uh, people in our community. And so I, I think I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I think to your point uh, about how we get more uh, young people, you know, my peers involved, um, in, in the process uh, is, is just to build excitement and momentum. Um, and I think, you know, one thing uh, that I think is really exciting from the space that I work in in food is that um, when we do have, you know, bipartisan support and push for issues that we really care about, we can make impacts. And so I think one one uh, particular uh, advance that I think we've seen in, in childhood nutrition, just to your story, um, a success story is, uh, programs like the the free and reduced lunch program. And I think, uh, honestly, just one of the most impactful and important programs probably in the history of the country. Um, it's uh, a program for those of you who aren't familiar where um, it's called the free and reduced lunch program. And so kids can uh, uh, have free or reduced lunch depending on their family income. And it's a program that is incredibly uh, effective. Over 85 to 90% of people who are eligible take part in those programs. And I think we've seen improved outcomes in, in, in children's health through that. Um, so I think, you know, the, the fact that there are solutions out there and that when we get excited about them, there's opportunities to make a real difference. And so when we think about yeah, we think about affordable housing and we think about, uh, you know, affordable food or electricity, energy and transportation. Um, I think it just takes us getting involved and getting excited about it and involved in the process to, to make a difference. So, Thank you, Zach. I'm fired up. I hope everybody else is. <laughs> we got time. I saw that there was a little bit of an extension here, but I, let's just take the top two questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, it looks like two have the most votes here. So I'm going to start with the second one, at least on my list. Um, and uh, the individual asks, government assistance programs assist lower poverty levels, but what is being done to help those? Oh, a third one popped in. What is being helped? Uh, what is being done to help those who do not meet those guidelines and are still struggling to pay rent? So I don't know if anyone, I'll just leave it up in the air, unmute yourself and dive in. I 
Um, wow, that's a tough question. It, yeah, I, for me, it really kind of goes back to um, some of the zoning stuff that Adam was talking about and um, the need to make it make it so that we can build more housing. Um, I think we've all seen that the prices for housing in Austin skyrocket. I certainly have since I got here in 2004. Um, but we're not considered to be in a bubble. And that is because the demand for housing in Austin consistently um, outpaces the supply. Um, a lot of great jobs are being developed here. And um, people, we have had fairly low unemployment. And so we're, we're still seeing people see Austin as an attractive place to move. So there's a high demand for housing and not nearly enough housing just in general being built. So loosening up zoning to encourage all types of housing to be built um, and more dense housing. I think you could also look at um, policy that encouraged folks that are bringing jobs to the area to also bring housing and affordable housing. <laughs> Um, and then uh, also um, paying people. So making sure that we are paying people. Thoughtful. Um, if we can squeeze them in, we got two with four votes and that's it, everyone. <laughs> so I'll start with the top one. How do we incentivize building affordable housing? Adam, you have any thoughts? Oh, well, I mean, we're working on that right now. Um, certainly one of the biggest incentive programs out there is the low income housing tax credit program. Um, like I said earlier, that's responsible for um, the majority of affordable housing that is built today. And what that does is it, um, the, the IRS actually allocates a bunch of tax credits with, to states and then states come up with a really elaborate um, Qualify, a qualified allocation process to, you know, developers get points for, you know, building in a high opportunity community or, you know, getting the letters that I was talking about or things like that. And um, so that's one way that the government does it. The government also is incentivizing it. Um, some, some Texas cities are incentivizing through a public facility corporation process um, where they are giving away um uh property tax exemptions in exchange developers that are, uh, provide a, um affordable units i think what's really important when we talk about incentives though is making sure that we're actually building affordable housing and uh, locking in some of these things like affordability periods we're serving low-income folks at 30 50 80 percent mostly at those lower income folks so because that's where the demand is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm answering the question correctly, but I, I mean, when the city is able to provide a public, you know, providing tax dollars for building affordable housing, they need to make sure that developers are actually going to um, provide it. Um, and so that means putting in strong guardrails. Um, I know that developers want to make a profit, but we want to make sure that people are being taken care of first. Mm. Thank you, Adam. I just got notice from people above my pay grade that this will actually end at 615. And so I'll wrap it up then. I will just say thank you so much for the thoughtful questions. Uh, Tori and others who are leading the way, you feel free to share my contact information, uh, certainly, and happy to get answers to some of those really good questions for you. Um, with that, I want to say thank you to Heidi and Adam and Zach for being so thoughtful and in your responses and, and being so impactful in the work that's very important that you do. And I'll also just say to all of you out there, uh, tomorrow's day two. So tune in again. We're gonna tackle homelessness and transportation. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from more uh, inspiring folks in the coming days. So uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings and have a great rest of the week.